What progress has been made in artificial intelligence? The main progress, I think, in artificial intelligence is that a lot of problems which used to be seen as a kind of long-term aim of artificial intelligence, like uh, having, having an electronic gadget that will listen to spoken commands and obey them. Think, now, that would have to be a really intelligent device. Well, they now exist, mobile phones. The, the iPod phone uh, has Siri, which is a, a voice recognition uh, and a fairly intelligent voice recognition system. But the interesting thing is we've now moved the goalposts. Because people have done this, instead of everyone saying, oh, look, we've got artificially intelligent phones, they say, oh, that's just what a phone can do. Artificial intelligence should do more than that. So the goals of artists, the goals that will let us actually stand up and say, here is an intelligent machine, have got more ambitious. As our machines get more intelligent by the old standards, instead of saying, well, we've cracked it, everyone said, hey, we can do better than that, can't we? So some people don't think machines can ever be intelligent. I think if you look at what machines can do nowadays, they are clearly more intelligent in a meaningful sense than anyone ever expected them to be 20 or 30 years ago. So I don't think it's out of the question to have a truly intelligent machine. It probably won't work the way our brains do, but that's a different question. Um, but the goals are getting more ambitious, but the progress is in fact substantial. How did the collaboration with Dr. Jack Cohen and Terry Pratchett come about? Jack is a biologist, I'm a mathematician, and Terry writes best-selling fantasy novels. So at first sight you think, how on earth could these people ever get together, let alone work with each other? Um, the connection is science fiction. Terry started out life as a journalist who was interested in science fiction and fantasy. And he was a fan and he went to the conventions. Jack Cohen was a biologist who was interested in science fiction. He went to the conventions. I was interested in science fiction. I still have a huge collection of science fiction books and magazines. I wasn't a conventional animal. So I just read the books. But one day, Jack discovered I was interested in um, areas of mathematics that he thought might be useful for biology. And he knew I was a science fiction fan, so he phoned me up out of the blue and said, let's, let's get together and have a chat. So we went to the local pub and we spent four hours in the local pub talking and decided that actually mathematicians and biologists had an awful lot in common. Soon after that, Novacon Science Fiction Convention in Birmingham was on and Jack said, oh, why don't you come along? So I went along, and he was introducing me to various of the fans, and Terry Pratchett turned up. He wasn't coming to give a talk, he was coming as a fan. And Jack knew him because they'd met at previous conventions before he was famous. So Jack introduced me to Terry, the three of us had lunch, we got on very well. We met up two or three times a year after that, and at some point the idea emerged, why don't we do a book together? So that's how it happened. What changes in maths education in the UK would you like to see? What I'd really like to see in maths education is less prescription from on high by the government. On Tuesday at 10 o'clock you will teach so and so, and every kid in the class must tick the box to show they know it, and next week we tick a different box, and we don't care what happened last week anymore because that's done. That's not a good way to teach. There are lots of talented maths teachers out there who are not being allowed to teach maths the way they want. They're not being allowed to tailor the way they do it to individual students. And I think if we could give the teachers more freedom, I think that would be, the payoff would be enormous. I think this prescriptive approach, it was a good idea up to a point, but it's gone much too far. Uh, I think the other thing that would be good is if the students could spend a little bit more time not being made to do the nuts and bolts of the maths, how to solve this problem, how to get this calculation, you know, and if you, if you, if you get it wrong, then it, it's wrong, and that's it, you must get the right answer. If we would spend a bit more time in schools telling them what maths is for, where it came from, what you can do with it, what kind of jobs you can get with it. A lot of people think the only job you can get is to be a maths teacher. Actually, 
the range of jobs with a mathematics degree is broader than almost any other degree subject, and you earn more money than almost any other degree subject. Talking of money, the Black-Scholes equation was used to justify the massive expansion of the derivatives trade uh, by irresponsible bankers. Can you explain a little about uh, complexity science and the improvements it could bring to economic models? Let's start with the Black-Scholes equation. This is a very sensible equation to put a price on an option. An option is a contract to buy or sell something like wheat at some future date at some particular price. It's a kind of guarantee or an insurance policy. But what the Black-Scholes equation does is tell you what it's worth part way through the contract. So then you could sell it to somebody else. And what it does is gives a reasonably sensible industry standard price. Everyone can agree this is the price that the equation tells you. And this gave rise to a huge market in these options. And then more complicated things called derivatives came along and more complicated mathematical models. And after a while it kind of escaped to the point at which everyone forgot that these models were actually based on some rather strong assumptions about how the financial markets work, such as uh, very big changes in price are very, very rare. The problem is they're not. These are often called black swan events. This is the famous phrase. Um, sudden changes in market prices happen far more often than these equations uh, assume. So the equations don't always work. And if you combine that with a whole other lot of other problems, then you get uh, a market which is being run on principles that it doesn't actually obey. So the idea is, can we... We can't just say, well, let's go back to the old way of doing it where everybody just invents off the top of their head what they think things are worth. That would probably be worse now. So you have to have some sort of rational way of doing things, some kind of mathematical model. So what we need is models that correspond more closely to what markets and traders really do. And complexity science is a relatively new area of science and mathematics which models that kind of system in terms of a large number of individuals interacting with each other according to a fairly limited, simple set of rules. So one person is buying, one person is selling, you have a rule for how they do this. And you can run these systems on computer models and simulate real markets in a more accurate way. For example, in a real market, most people do not have perfect information about everything that's going on. But the mathematical models assume that they did. With a complexity model, it's easy to modify the rules so that some people don't know as much as other people do, or that nobody knows very much. And you can tune your, your rules to try and get the right kind of behaviour. What are you working on next? I'm working on networks, which is a wonderful area. Almost everything in the world seems to be a network. The internet is a network of people interacting by computers, um, and even the people who run the internet kind of say, well, <laughs> we no longer understand exactly what it's doing. You know, the, these networks have almost a mind of their own. In biology, there are all sorts, there are genetic networks, there are networks of organisms interacting in an ecosystem, uh, economic models are, are networks of individuals trading with each other. And we talk about networking. Yes, networking is the thing to do. Well, the mathematics of networks is absolutely fascinating. It's got several components which came together from different directions. It goes back a couple of hundred years, so there's the structure of the network just as a net, you know, what are the individuals, how are they connected? But then there's the dynamics of the network, how does everything change over time? And so I'm doing some fairly basic, rather formal mathematics at the moment, trying to set up a framework for analysing networks and understanding the general kinds of things they can do. Professor Ian Stewart, thank you very much.